I'm from Texas, so if you, I have to apologize if you hear if it's an accent that uh, um, is hard to understand. It's it's my Texas accent. Actually, I was actually born in Karachi, Pakistan, but raised in Texas. I'm actually a dual dual citizen. Uh, I'm an American, and I'm also a Texan. And, and, uh, and don't ask me to pick which which. <laughs> but uh, we had this thing when I was leaving Texas and going to Washington. Um, uh, I was told, you know, I got some advice from some friends, and they said, look. Sure, you know, Washington, D.C. is a whole new world. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they go, well, in Washington, the shorter your title, the more important you are. You know, uh, president, senator, etc. So my first uh, position ever was special counsel for post-9-11 national origin discrimination. <laughs> and then progressively, you know, the title of senior policy advisor, director, and things. And then, of course, when I got appointed to this job by the president, it was, again, a special representative to... So, uh, you know, it, but it, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting job, and I thought what we do today is I have some, I have some uh, remarks I'd like to share. Uh, and then I really hope we have some time for some questions and answers, because uh, to me, uh, and very respectfully, sir, uh, the most important thing I do, you know, I, because of this job, you get to engage government officials, you know, heads of state, civil society leaders, religious leaders. But the most important thing I do is what I'm doing, engaging young people, students. To this energizes me, frankly. We need to do a lot more of this. Uh, so I know, frankly, you all could be doing so many other things, and the fact that you're here uh, is a real honor for me. Um, I'm really honored to have this opportunity to talk about the United States rebalance to Asia, and specifically this part of the world, Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia region, um, and especially this school. So when I was researching my remarks, uh, you know, thinking about what I'd say here, I, I, real, I came across this, the RSIS motto, uh, ponder the improbable. Now look, this is a terrific school. Uh, you know, I know Professor Nawab is a dear friend of mine, and you know, he and I have had a chance uh, to, to talk you know, over the years. Uh, but this, this motto, ponder the improbable, uh, makes a lot of sense. Now, your focus is on international affairs, security studies, so obviously in that field you have to ponder the improbable. And frankly, given the challenges both our countries face, the United States and Singapore, it's not only important, it's absolutely necessary that we ponder the improbable. But I have to say, uh, this motto resonates with me on a very personal level. Now, because arguably, the fact that I'm here today is, in, in many respects, improbable. You know, who would have thought that a Karachi-born, Texas-educated lawyer would be speaking at one of the world's finest institutions named after a Sri Lankan-born journalist, right, who rose to the ranks of the uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore, right? But, but so on, at first blush, that seems quite unlikely, except these types of occurrences are frankly more and more likely and happening all the time in Singapore and the United States. The reality is both in the United States and Singapore, if you look at our citizenry, the people that live here, you have every religion, race, ethnicity, tribe, right? These are strengths. These are national assets. This makes this type of diversity it makes our country stronger. And frankly, these are models and these are lessons that I, th I, I wish more people, including in this region, Southeast Asia, they need to learn. You know, a few weeks ago, I spoke at my alma mater, the University of Texas. And uh, specifically, there's a Strauss Center for International Security and Law there. And like RSIS, it's a think tank within a larger university, right? And this trip, and that visit and this trip frankly, underscored to me the important role these types of institutions play. Because you, you know, you're, you're at this amazing, you know, prestigious university, but you're also a think tank. And not only are, you know, there's research, you know, obviously that being done, which is incredibly important, but you're preparing your students for actual life, life in the policy arena, actual practical skills and things like that. Yeah, the deep critical analysis that frankly is necessary. So, you know, and it takes me back, being a student, I'm not so young anymore, uh, but it takes me back, you know, to uh, when I'm, I'm on campuses like this. And, you know, I, as a student, I, I focus on human rights, I focused on international affairs, policy, um, law, I eventually went to law school. And upon completing my education, I joined a law firm, one of the oldest firms in Houston. And it was mostly a domestic practice, I represented banks, uh, you know, commercial litigation, things like that. Uh, so, but I, you know, I always wanted to work on international affairs. So I always was trying to figure out how do I get back to what I wanted to do. I was representing big banks. 
And so, like you all are doing, I pondered the improbable. I, rely, you know, I, I relied on a network of uh, mentors, of friends. And by the way, who here, by the way, has a mentor? Does anybody, like, raise your hand if you have a mentor. That's crazy, frankly. I'll, I'll be real, that's, that's, that's crazy. You all, the, one of the most important things that you can do, this is a quick aside with your permission, one of the most important things that you can do if, if you're trying to you know, develop your, your careers, and I'm sorry to be so blunt, but uh, mentors open doors for you. And there's two types. There's one type of mentor that he, over he or she is, uh, does what you want to do. So let's say you want to be a professor, you know, and you, you reach out to a professor time. Or if you want to be in government or a law, right? The other type of mentor is someone who, he, over he or she is, is just a very senior, accomplished individual, and they'll open doors for you, right? And the world is a, is a, is a, is a you know, it's, it's, there's a lot of talent there, and there's a lot of competition. And oftentimes, it is important what you know, but it's also important who you know. And so, I really encourage you, this is, it's not just an American model. I, I believe this is true internationally, globally. So if you don't have a mentor, you should get a mentor. But I digress. So, you know, I never, you know, I, I, I wanted to get back. And so I, in, in international affairs. And so pondering the improbable, I, you know, I, um, you know, I, 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 I found a way. And, but I never dreamed that I would have the chance to work at the White House, uh, to work at the State Department in this role as an official appointee representing my government, or work in an administration or, in, or serve a president whose life, frankly, if you know anything about President Obama, his life exemplifies what it means to have an improbable journey. Now, of course, his life, this journey began in the Pacific. So, a lot of times when we ask, you know, why the focus of this rebalance to Asia? Is there, does it have its roots in the president's biography? Now, there's no question the president, you know, his background is plays an important role in his life. And, the, you know, of course, everybody knows he spent some time next door in Indonesia. Uh, so, of course, and he's written about this. This has shaped his worldview. But uh, the simple fact is our rebalance is just good policy. It's, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, the, the reason behind it, if you just look at the facts, if you look at what the benefits are, it makes sense. And it doesn't make sense just for the United States. It makes sense, you know, for our partners in the region, for all of us. Now, the president's been clear. He talked about there's few, re few regions in the world that are more important to the 21st century than the Asia Pacific. And so that's why, at the very beginning of his administration, he made a commitment to rebalance our efforts. Now, that's not to say that we don't care about other parts of the world. We certainly do. South Asia, the Middle East, Europe, where we have very important allies. We just had a, a very important state visit uh, from the Nordic countries just last week. So, you know, we have the luxury and the benefit, and frankly, we're grateful to have a lot of alliances, and we care about a lot of parts of the world. But the reasons for our rebalance to Asia, and specifically Asia specific, the Pacific, are both compelling and straightforward. Nowhere in the world are economic and strategic opportunities clearer than here. There's home to four of our top ten trading partners, five of the seven of our treaty alliances, uh, the world's largest and, and fastest growing economies. Forty percent of overall growth is happening in this area. Nearly two-thirds of the global middle class. And frankly, if you think about connectivity, this part of the world has some of the most dynamic, innovative, and connected communities in the world. Now, my boss, Secretary Kerry, he's talked about this. And with respect to our foreign policy, he said, as a Pacific nation that takes our Pacific partnership incredibly seriously, the United States will continue to build on our active and enduring presence. Now, how are we doing this? Right? These are words, but what are we actually doing? Our objectives are clear. We're modernizing our alliances. We're strengthening ties with emerging partners. We're supporting effective regional institutions like APEC and ASEAN that strive to pro solve problems using a rules-based uh, rules system. We're ensuring our military presence is, a, is effective and supports the full range of our engagement. But we're also promoting democracy and development. In support of Burma's historic elections, we, we, uh, we established the nation's first ever nonpartisan independent election observation organization. We trained over 11,000 political party members to improve their ability to effectively communicate and vote with, uh, communicate with voters. And, this is, and we're, not just, you know, we're, we're not just engaging governments, we're building, you know, we're reaching out to people. The, the ASEAN uh, YC, the Young Leaders Initiative, 
Young Southeast Asian Leaders Initiative has 67,000 young people involved from throughout the region. And that includes young Southeast Asian Muslims as well. Now, of course, one of them, you know, if you look for, you know, for obvious reasons for the, the rebalance, economic. And the heart of our economic engagement is, of course, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which will bring 12 APEC uh, economies and over 40% of the world's GDP together. It will solidify an economic arena in which every participant, regardless of size, agrees to fight bribery and corruption, abide by international labor standards, including the formation of trade unions, and commits to enforcement of environmental safeguards. Now, some of you might be surprised. I'm the special representative to Muslim communities, right? But the TPP has been a central, central focus of mine. Now, earlier I mentioned my time as a student. I studied law, you know, politics, international affairs. Uh, but on a lark, uh, both at law school and undergrad, I studied Islamic affairs, Islamic studies, Islamic law. Kind of on a lark, maybe for personal reasons. My, I'm, you know, I'm Muslim. My family comes from a Muslim uh, family, uh, Muslim background. You know, so I studied Islamic law. You know, there's not, a, there's not a whole market for Islamic law in the United States. Though, you know, not what's in Islamic finance. But I never dreamed that years later my studies would actually be relevant because I've twice visited Brunei now and have had, you know, we've had an ongoing engagement with the government about the implica implications of that country's Sharia penal code uh, on, you know, the, on upholding interna international human rights. Because, you know, part of TPP's central aims is to, to raise, you know, you know, to make sure that we have human rights standards. So, you know, <clears throat> we've, we've been engaging for an eye on that. Now, as an American, you know, we, the United States, it's interesting, it's a bit of a paradox. We're a secular government, but the United States is a very deeply religious country, right? We're very, you know, in fact, I, uh, you know, my office is on the seventh floor where the secretary is. And every Friday, all the Muslims, if you want, you walk down four flights of stairs and there's a room set aside for Jummah, for prayers, for Friday prayers. In our Capitol building, you know, our legislature, a conservative Republican member of Congress, Newt Gingrich, he actually made, when he was uh, Speaker of the House, he made a space available for Muslims to pray, right? So, you know, the United States, we're a deeply religious country. And when you leave your house, you don't leave your religion behind, your religion goes with you. But... As an American, and as a government official, and as an American civil rights lawyer, I believe very strongly in our First Amendment, and we have an establishment clause that limits, the, you know, there's a separation of religion and state. Now, we believe that's a central concept, because if you, you, know, you prevent uh, for government from interfering in religion, and that ensures freedom of religion, which is a fundamental principle. But I also understand that in societies like Brunei, in traditional societies, religion, such as Islam, plays a role. But I'm very proud to say that there's, you know, there's a lot of work that remains. You know, and we work in the, but thus far, our engagement has actually paid off and has been quite constructive. Uh, Brunei has agreed to sign the Convention Against Torture. And, uh, you know, and we, we're continuing to have a conversation about, with them about the importance that they demonstrate their commitment to upholding fundamental rights if, you know, if and when they, can, they implement their Sharia penal code. So again, you know, ponder the improbable indeed. You, know, who, you, you have no idea. Uh, what you're studying now, uh, how it actually uh, you know, pay off later. So listen to what your professors say. <laughs> right. Now, only four ASEAN countries are in TPP. But we believe, and I believe, that frankly, the TPP will benefit the entire region. And, I'm, and we're optimistic that others will join. And as your prime minister recently argued, getting the TPP done will deepen links on both sides of the Pacific. Now, speaking, I'll be, I'll be honest, finding mutually beneficial initiatives in international affairs, it's not always easy. But with, with respect to our rebalance to Asia, it's not even close. And that's true for the United States, and it's true for our partners in the region. Increasing our engagement helps the United States. Has, you know, there's more opportunities to sell our goods. In fact, in 2012, so this is four years ago, so the numbers I imagine have gone up, 555 billion in U.S. exports of goods and services to the region have, are estimated to support the creation of um, up to 2.8 million American jobs. So this helps us, right? But the benefits for the region are also clear. Economically, by far, the United States, by far, it's not even close, we're the leading investor in the region. And our trade is expanding. Uh, we're engaged in economic and commercial issues across the board. In 2012, again, these numbers are a bit stale, so I'd argue that, you know, we don't have the recent numbers, but in 2012, 
Our foreign direct investment in the East Asia Pacific was $622 billion, reflecting a 35% increase since the beginning of the Obama administration. And these investments are from our dynamic private sector, you know, they, yeah, and they support jobs in the region. And frankly, they, they, they reflect what is not a short-term worldview, but frankly, our long-term commitment to the region. Now, how does the U.S. rebalance to the Asia Pacific, to Asia, how does it impact, or what's the relevance to Muslim communities? Because that, that's my, my role. As Secretary Kerry's special representative to Muslim communities, my job is to drive our engagement with Muslim communities around the world, and it's global. So, you know, Europe, Asia, Africa, the Middle East, arguably South America, uh, to drive this engagement on issues of mutual interest and support of shared goals. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, 1.6 billion. And by and large, they care about the same issues Everybody does. How do I put food on my table? How do I make sure that my kids have an education? How do we, you know, how do, how do we pr protect our environment? You know? How do we, ma making sure that we, you know, we have an economy that grows? Right? How, how do we live in peace and security? You know, there's, yes, there's 1.6 billion Muslims, but they're like everybody else. Now, my mandate is global, as I said. I've visited, you know, the country of my birth, Pakistan. I've visited Turkey. I've visited India, the Middle East. And so one assumption people hear when they hear about my title, they think, okay, you spent all your time in the Middle East, maybe in South Asia, right? And many are surprised that one of my prime areas of focus is Southeast Asia. Now, it, frankly, it shouldn't be surprising because any, if anybody knows anything about this region, it has one of the world's largest numbers. Of, I, mean, I mean, the Muslim population here, you know, just in this region, you compare that to the Middle East, I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's, it's enormous. We're talking, you know, the largest Muslim country, Muslim majority country in Indonesia, Muslim sizable populations here. Now, in our partnerships with the countries of Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, they, they, they span from climate change to countering extremism. Now, this is my fourth trip to the region. I made multiple stops to Brunei multiple st uh, stops to Singapore. I think this is my third visit to Singapore. Uh, Malaysia, I've been three times. I'm going there next. I've, spent, I've been to t Indonesia twice, and there's another trip planned. And the reason I come here is because this, is va you know, Asia, this region is vital to our rebalance, but it's also vital to our specific efforts to engage Muslim communities. Now, and the reason why is because this region is defined not just by challenges, but increasingly by opportunities. So what are these challenges? Well, let's start with the scourge of violent extremism. You know, this threatens the United States. It threatens our partners. And frankly, it threatens Muslim communities who by far, overwhelmingly, are the victims of terrorism. Now, the, the January tar attacks in Jakarta, you know, they just, they, they tell us that, of course, this region, sadly, is no stranger. And what's scary is that these terrorist groups are recruiting in local, in local languages. They're engaging young people on online platforms, right? And they're using speech and themes that, that resonate with young people. Now, what makes this difficult to counter is that there is no one specific pathway, right? There's no grand unified theory of violent extremism. Some extremists believe that are motivated by religion. Others aren't, frankly, religious at all. Some are illiterate. Some are very highly educated. Some are motivated by the, a sense of purpose, right? Others seek adventure. Some become disenchanted. They, they go over to Syria and they, they see the reality, and, and, but some become true believers. Now, I've been in this space for over a decade, and I have to say that, our, that we're getting better, we're getting much smarter, and our, and our understanding of this process of radicalization of violence is much, more, is much more complex. You know, we used to think it was a linear, kind of a linear progression. You come in, you start one end, and you leave the other end radicalized, and that's simply not the case. There's no single pathway. Uh, there's individual, you know, psychological factors. There's group dynamics. Sectarianism can play a role. Uh, and these persist, by the way. This models that we're talking about, it's not just uh, radicalization with respect to Islamic people who purport to speak on behalf of Islam. This is true. You know, the United States, sadly, we don't have the luxury of, of suffering from one type of violent extremism. You know, we have right-wing groups, left-wing groups. Uh, you know, there's no single pathway. But there's some things that we see as common factors that give oxygen, as we say, to violent extremism. 
feelings of alienation, exposure to propaganda increasingly online, a lack of critical thinking skills, state-sanctioned violence, abuses by military or security services. Now, in addressing the challenge of violent extremism, what, what, what makes me have hope, because frankly, you can imagine, given my portfolio, it can be quite depressing, but I, what gives me hope is that in this part of the world, I see a lot of opportunities. For example, Islam in Indonesia, Islam Nusantara, Islam of the archipelago, has a rich tradition of tolerance, of pluralism, of inclusion. The world's, not just the world's largest Muslim organizations, but some of the world's, I think, frankly, the world's largest organizations in terms of civil society, period, full stop. No. Excuse me. This is what happens when you give too many speeches. Uh, you know, but the Nalatul Ulama Muhammadiyah, you know, they, not only do they represent these incredibly important religious voices, but, but, but they, they give their, their members a voice to play an active role in society. And they run thousands of boarding schools, the, uh, what, what's called in Indonesia, Pasantran. Has anybody here been to a Pasantran? I've actually been you know, to several. And what's fascinating, and, and if you're interested in good models in the region, I would, and I, this is an area that you know, Professor Nawab's not nodding, it's worth exploring because when you go, when you see some of them, it's remarkable. You see boys and girls studying together. Now, sometimes they'll be, you know, often be segregated in terms of one side boys, one side girls. What they're studying, economics, calculus. I walked into one outside of Jakarta, and there was a formula. And I frankly had no idea what it meant. <laughs> you know, I mean, the other interesting thing, you can take your degree from a Pasantran, and you can go to any university in Indonesia, including very elite institutions. Now, you compare that model with madrasas in other parts of the world, where all you do is, you know, rote memorization. You know, you learn the Quran, the Quran, you learn the Sunnah. Now look, the Quran for a Muslim is incredibly important. I'm not suggesting that this shouldn't be studied. What I'm suggesting is that if you want to have a job other than an imam, that you, these, you know, schools need to prepare their young people for life in modern times. And if you only are offered rote memorization, then you're going to have limited opportunities. Now, I, I often tell my Indonesian counterparts, and you know, I've, I've, you know, I've, uh, I had the honor of meeting uh, President Jokowi, the Indonesian Vice President was also in, in Washington, uh, and, and I've, you know, I, I've met with uh, senior government officials and uh, senior civil society religious leaders. And, I, and the one thing about this part of the world, and this includes, you know, people are very humble, you know, and that's a good thing. I respect that. But with respect to their model of religious education. And frankly, other models as well. I tell my Indonesian counterparts, frankly, I need you to be less humble. Honestly, I need, I need you to export your models. You know, there's, you have the largest Muslim population in the world. Because there's other models that are being propagated to the tune of billions of dollars. And I would argue that the model that they're propagating is one not of diversity, not one of inclusion, not one of tolerance, right? And here's one that, frankly, you have the largest Muslim population in the world in this region. You have a, not only do you have a seat at the table, we need your help. Look, uh, yes, I'm Muslim, but I'm a U.S. government official. I have zero credibility when it comes to what Islam is or what Islam isn't. God help you for looking for me for religious instruction. That's not my job. My job is not to engage Islamic communities. My job is to engage Muslim communities, whether it's environmentalists, entrepreneurs, students, young people. You know. But there, there is clearly a role for religious instruction, and I think there's great models here. And look, the other thing, in addition to you know, being less humble, I think you have to engage young people in a language they understand and on platforms they use. Now traditionally, you know, that was the Friday sermon, the khutbah, right? Where somebody will say, you know, I'll say, oh yes, I've written a new book, and they'll give me this book. Young people don't read books like they used to. You know, attention spans are shrinking. You know, cell phones are important, right? So the question is, is it's not, no longer a 45-minute 40 40 sermon. Right? It's a 45 second video or two, you know, 10 five minute videos, right? That's what we have to, that's what we have to develop. And, you know, I was actually, um, I, was, I, was, I was actually quite uh, impressed recently. I came across an article, I don't know if you saw it. Uh, I can't remember if it's Nathul Ulama or I think it's Nathul Ulama. Maybe it's Muhammad the Edger. But um, they actually, there's a group, they're now taking on uh, terrorist internet operations. Um, and it, it, was, it, it was quite good. They're developing apps, web-based TV channels, and things like that. Now, I'm trying to, look, I'm trying to do my role as well. So I actually, I funded a workshop of Indonesian uh, and Nigerian Pakistani 
media act and media officials, and we, I sent them to the, perhaps the world's best film school, the University of Southern California uh, School of Cinematic Arts. That's where George Lucas and all these you know, amazing folks have trained. And we, it was a three-week workshop. On, and it, it, what it did is we, it allowed media personalities from these regions to look for ways to integrate themes into popular television, right? So, you know, to integrate, you know, uh, themes about female education, about empowerment, countering extremism, countering sectarianism, and also, you know, looking for ways to, 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 to develop, you know, to engage on new media, social media, things like that. Now, look, we didn't tell them what to say, right? Because when it comes to Muslim communities, we have a story to tell. We have great stories, right? Sometimes we just need help s telling the story, you know, building the capacity. So that was the focus. Because one of the best ways to defeat a bad story is a better story. Now, another challenge that we're facing here in this region, frankly, and globally, and frankly in the United States, is one of increasing tolerance and discrimination. Right? Um, you can imagine, my, my job as special representative to Muslim communities, you can imagine what I get asked about <laughs> when I travel. Now, Combating discrimination and tolerance, this is of course important in its own right. These are important ends in and of themselves. But there's also the additional risk that if people feel alienated and excluded, that they'll look for validation elsewhere. And, you know, and one you know, possible manifestation, one possible reason for the manifestation of radicalization in Europe, frankly, is the fact that many Muslim communities have been excluded, have been, feel alienated. Now, of course, alienation is no excuse for violence. Period, full stop, right? But, you know, if people, you know, if, if, if people feel excluded, then, you know, the terrorist recruiters will say, look, you're not German, you're not French, you're not British, you never will be, you're part of this ummah, right? And that, you know, fr and that, and that can, so, but th nah, that's not to say that discrimination shouldn't be combated just because it's bad, of course. Now, look, it happens around the world, it's a global phenomenon. It happens in Muslim-majority countries. It happens in Muslim minority countries. You know, we've expressed, uh, and I have, a, you know, I, I, I have a lot of love for Malaysia. I've spent a lot of time in Malaysia. Um, but we've expressed, you know, uh, our, our views, uh, our strong opposition to uh, ethnic preferences. You know, and of course, uh, we've raised and expressed our strong opposition to the persecution and discrimination of minority communities, such as the Rohingya in Burma. But this is not the entire story, right? Just like, just like you know, there there are, there are other models in this region that are worth that, that you know sometimes people don't think about as much that are really positive. So Singapore, I mentioned, I think Singapore is a terrific. In this example of diversity, how it's it's a strength of your country, uh, it's a strength of your country. You know, and frankly, we need you to share it more, you know, because it's a strength of ours. And I know I, I know I'm repeating myself, but I really mean this. Diversity is a strength. You know, you, in, in America, 40 percent, something like 40 or 50 percent of Silicon Valley startups, the exact numbers I don't know, but that's right, are from people who have an immigrant background, right? So there's, a, there's a, of course, a civil rights case for preventing discrimination. There's a security case. But frankly, this diversity, there's a business case for it, too. It just makes good sense. But there's other really good models. So one, uh, one project I'm funding in Malaysia is an entrepreneurship beehive. And because in this part of the world, you know, the, the large numbers of the population are under 30 years old, and young people are going to need jobs. And look, they're not going to be government jobs, and by the way, they're not going to be large corporate jobs. So entrepreneurship, promoting entrepreneurship is incredibly important. So I invested in a, a, a program at the University of Malaysia, Kelantan, Kota Baru, very close to the Thai border. And it was an entrepreneurship beehive. And I was very moved to learn that a group of women students, you know, all Malaysian Muslim, they took this training about how do you start a business, you know, really practical, concrete skills. And they took this workshop. Now, what do they do? This is amazing. A group of Muslim LA women, they, on their own, they self-funded a trip to Borneo, to another part of Malaysia, on their own, and they helped a Christian village establish a bakery. Right? That's amazing. To me, that is the true story. That's the story that I like telling you about Malaysia, because to me, that, tells, that represents Malaysia at its best. Now, I have to say, when it comes to intolerance and discrimination, I have to proceed with some humility. Now, I'm, I'm a very proud American. I'm very proud of our commitment to human rights and civil rights. But, uh, you know, we've had our challenges, and the President's talked about this. And I mentioned earlier when I began, 
that my first job in government was the uh, special counsel for 9-11 backlash. And, you know, we, we had a spike in hate crimes after 9-11, after, you know, against people who looked like me, you know. Sometimes, uh, you know, actually the first victim of a 9-11 uh, backlash crime was actually a Sikh, uh, Babur Singh Sodhi, I remember, in Mesa, Arizona. So, you know, I learned firsthand, you know, combining ignorance with bigotry is a very dangerous combination. Now, given some of the rhetoric that you've heard, if you've been watching CNN and others about, you know, what's going on, this is an election season, you can imagine uh, what I get asked about, you know, and we can, we can talk about this. You know, but just, just as in, you know, in the Southeast Asian context, I would submit to you that's not the entire story. I was in the room, I had the huge honor and privilege of being in the room when my president, President Obama, went to a mosque in Baltimore. You know, and he was addressing Muslim congregants at the Islamic Society of Baltimore, and he said that Muslims are part of the American family. An attack on one faith is an attack on all our faiths. He was speaking, you know, as a father of two girls, he was speaking to you know, young, young, young Muslim, Muslim, Muslim Americans, he goes, look, if any of you are fit in, wondering where you fit in, you fit in right here. You're, you're right where you belong. You're not Muslim or American, you're Muslim and American. Now, these aren't just words. Now, that was incredibly powerful, both personally and professionally. But these aren't just words. The president's words reflect our policy. You know, as a result of our, we've had a civil rights movement, and that wasn't easy. But because of the work of Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks, we have a system of laws that, prevent, that address discrimination. And they don't just sit on our books. We enforce them. You know, when I was, you know, when I was a lawyer at our Justice Department, you know, we sued an Oklahoma school district that banned a little girl from wearing her hijab. I sued the New York subway system. There was a Sikh man that actually got a, he got an award on 9-11 for helping, you know, rescue passengers. But several years later, all of a sudden, his turban violated a dress code. And there were some Muslim women who wanted to wear the hijab. And they were told they couldn't, they couldn't wear their dress code. You know, they couldn't wear it. Now, of course, you wear Yankees hats or New York Mets caps, that, no problem. So we sued, you know, I sued the New York subway system as a team of attorneys. Because again, the United States, we're, we're a secular government, but we're a religious country. Now, beyond government actions, I have to say there have been some numerous positive actions of just the American people. And these are stories that, frankly, you probably haven't heard about. Maybe you have. But I think they're important, you know, they're, they're worth sharing. There were a thousand Jewish Americans, a thousand rabbis. They wrote a letter about the importance of admitting Syrian Muslim refugees. There was a community in Indiana, the central part of the country, that sent money to a Catholic organization, a, a Christian organization, in support of Muslim refugees. So you had Jews helping Christians, helping Muslims. You know, the Muslim American community also, you know, after the San Bernardino attack, they raised $200,000 for the victims of San Bernardino. And the best story that I talk about a lot, and maybe you've heard of it, there's a seven-year-old boy in my home state of Texas. And there was a local mosque that was vandalized. Now, I'm saying, this happens. You know, I'm, I'm, I can't deny these types of attacks. You know, they, they do happen. They're not, they're not regular. They're by and large uh, not the norm, but they do happen. You know, bigotry and, and uh, racism exists around the world, including the United States. But in response, this little boy, he saw, seven years old, he saw that this mosque was vandalized. He, he, had, a, he had a piggy bank. He was saving up for an iPad. And he was so moved by it, he took the, the, the piggy bank and he took it to the, to the leaders of the mosque. who were so moved, they actually bought him uh, the iPad. And, and, so, and so that's, to frankly... That's the true story. That's, I mean, just like the South, the, the young Malaysian women, that's America at its best. Now, you, know, you may not see that in news reports, because frankly, that doesn't always get the attention. But let me tell you, that happens. You know? And that happens more and more, more frequently. And you, frankly, you've had both, you know, both leaders of, uh, of both parties, Republicans and Democrats, that have spoken out against some of the, all this ugly rhetoric. Now, we've talked about trade. We've talked about extremism. Right? We've talked about intolerance. But another area of opportunity is climate change. I believe there's tremendous opportunity. Now, the fact is, when it comes to you know, this part of the world, the majority of the countries have some type of coastline or another. And as global temperatures rise, oceans warm, and they expand, and ice melts. And we know, this, we know, and, you know, the overwhelming majority of scientists have concluded this has caused sea, sea levels to rise. Now, globally, sea levels rose four to ten inches last century. Four, ten inches. And they expect, researchers expect sea levels to continue to rise. You know, and this is going to make, 
you know, millions, millions of Southeast Asia's you know, uh, uh, low-lying coastal communities increasingly vulnerable to tsunamis, to storm surge, to flooding. And beyond the impact to coastal communities, this is going to impact, this impacts, frankly, the viability and the survivability of our oceans. Now, World Ocean Day is coming up. June 8th is World Oceans Day. And it's something to remember. In the science of it, you know, it's interesting, you know, especially representative of Muslim communities. I'm talking about climate change. Because guess what? It is relevant to Muslim communities, especially in this part of the world. Secretary Kerry's first speech on climate change was in Indonesia. That wasn't by accident. Because increased carbon dioxide levels, they lead to acidification. And that threatens sea life, right? And it's not just the ecological impact. You know, as sea life uh, migrates to other parts of the world, now fishermen, people, you know, you know, livelihoods are impacted. Now, the good news, again, what, what energizes me, what excites me about this part of the world is that, you know, there's, there's some good examples. Faith communities, for example, are taking action. From grassroots efforts to policy decisions, houses of worship are taking steps to green their properties, imams are modifying some ritual practices such as ab ablution, you know, wudu, right, to minimize their environmental impact. Religious thinkers are talking about theological and ethical uh, resources for the, of the traditions of implications. You know, essentially, in many faith traditions, including in Islam, there's, re, there's, there's a, a body of theology that talks about the importance of protecting the environment. I think in the Quran, there's a, there's a, there's a clause about how humanity are God's vicegerents uh, on earth, right? And, the, and what's interesting and what I'm excited about is that in addition to the scientists, religious communities, including Muslims, are lending their voices. And it's exciting. Uh, and, uh, you know, and what's exciting is you know, you've got Pope Francis, his encyclical on the environment, the Laudato Si, the recent Islamic declaration on climate, and statements by other prominent Christian, Buddhist, Jewish, um, and Hindu leaders. And what's interesting is religious organizations are also playing an important role in grappling with the impact of climate change. Helping communities provide relief service, you know, after natural disasters, partnering with farmers and other communities who are vulnerable to look for ways that they can develop more sustainable uh, approaches. Now, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change is designed to support these efforts and provide uh, financing. There's a green, you know, green climate fund. And it's going to provide economic incentives for something like deforestation, which frankly is relevant in this part of the world, places like Borneo, wildlife trafficking and environmental challenges. And I'm happy to report that Muslim communities are, in, are leading the battle against climate change. And the fact, the role of Muslim communities is actually going to be highlighted next November in Marrakesh. Uh, there's going to be a conference of parties there. It will offer an opportunity to galvanize the region around the emerging opportunities for green development uh, and regional and global collaboration in support of healthy and sustainable development. Now, let me conclude, because I want to make sure we have some time for questions answered. I have really enjoyed this opportunity. This, this university, this, by the way, you should know, we're well aware about of this university, RSIS. It has a global reputation. And the fact that I was given this opportunity today is really a professional highlight. And I was really honored that I had an opportunity to talk about the very important US rebalance to Asia, as well as my specific context of Muslim community engagement. And you know, we just touched on, I, you know, I could have talked for half an hour longer, because you know, there's, again, 1.6 billion Muslims. And they care about the same issues as everybody else. So, you know, we didn't even touch upon entrepreneurship or poverty or development. And, you know, there, and there's so many other areas that we could have gone into. Because in many respects, Muslim community engagement just reflects our broader foreign policy goals. And so thank you so much. This has really been a terrific, really terrific honor of mine. And I think, you know, Professor Tom, with your permission, I'd love to have a conversation. So again, thank you so much.